First, I'd like to thank Alison and Matty for kindly inviting us to share this, this session. And then it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Erin O'Halloran, who's a historian of empire and transnational connectivity across the Middle East, South Asia and Europe. She completed her DPhil at St. Anthony's College, Oxford in 2019, and is presently a visiting fellow at the Bill Graham Centre for Contemporary International History, University of Toronto. Her forthcoming book is called Empire in the East, Egypt, India, and the World Between the Wars. She's also an article out now at the International History Review, titled India, the Arabs, and Britain's Problem in Palestine. But this evening, I think she's going to talk about some more specific um, topic of the relationship between India and the Arab world. Um, anyway, it just gives me great pleasure to, to welcome Dr. Halloran. And um, just one other thing for housekeeping. If you have any questions, Alison will um, monitor them in the Q&A, you know, chat box, and um, they would then we'll sort of be read out, but not um, after at the end. I think Erin's going to talk for about 40 minutes and then there'll be this Q&A. Okay, welcome. Thank you so much, Erin, for making the effort. <laughs> Um, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Rosalind, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Alison, for the invitation as well. Um, I'm absolutely del delighted to be at uh, the Royal Asiatic Society and delighted to be hosted by the Islamic Art Circle at SOAS as well. Uh, and I'm just going to share my screen. So give me one minute here to get this set up. So is that is that OK? Can you all see? Yes. OK, fantastic. Uh, so without further ado, in that case, I will just uh, move everything around so that I can see it on my screen. <laughs> All right. So um, my research, as Rosalind mentioned, and my forthcoming book focus on the interwar period. Uh, this was an age of rapid technological advancement, social, political and economic upheaval. And among many other things, it was also an era of dynamic interaction and ideational exchange between people living in South Asia and the Middle East. As the 1920s gave way to the 1930s, men and women in the colonized East were, like their European counterparts, increasingly conscious of moving in the shadows of a gathering storm. The Second World War would soon engulf the world, irrevocably transforming their lives and the global political order around them. My question is how the relationships between Arabs and South Asians contributed to the nature of those transformations. What role did Cairo and Jerusalem play in shaping political discourses in pre-independence India? What do Indo-Pakistani archives and sources have to tell us about the evolution of nationalism in places like Egypt and Iraq or the unfolding crisis in Mende Palestine? And how do the answers to these questions alter our understanding of the interwar British Empire and the lead up to decolonization in Asia more generally? In seeking to respond to these questions, I have consulted a variety of textual, visual, oral and video sources from the Middle East, South Asia, the UK and continental Europe. The result is a book, Empire in the East. Oops. Sorry, slight problem with my, there we go. The result is a book, Empire in the East, Egypt, India, and the World Between the Wars, which traces intersecting narratives about the political activists, imperial agents, anti-colonial feminists, journalists, artists, propagandists, and pan-Islamists throughout the eventful decades which separate the first from the second world war. From the outset of the 20th century, Egyptian and Indian nationalist leaders understood their campaigns for self-determination as linked or even as elements of a shared project. Historians like Michael Goebel and Noor Khan have traced these contacts to the early 1900s when students and journalists from across the colonized world began encountering one another in cities like Paris, London, and Berlin. During and after World War I, these contacts began to flourish into increasingly complex networks of connection. In my book, I explore these networks from multiple perspectives. For today, however, I'm just going to focus 
on the impact of the Middle East, on the evolution of nationalism, nationalist political strands within India up to the outbreak of the Second World War. So to begin, I'll just briefly recap some of the key outcomes of World War I for the Middle East and India. Of course, the war resulted in the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Throughout the Levant, the British and French awarded themselves de jure control of former Ottoman territories under the newly established League of Nations system of mandates, including the Palestine mandate granted to Britain. So this was a source of intense frustration and resentment throughout the Arab region as it went against Britain's wartime pledges in the Hussein McMahon correspondence to support the establishment of an independent Arab kingdom at war's end. But the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire at the hands of the victorious allies was also a source of trauma for Indian Muslims, who had played a crucially important role in the Allied war effort. Many found themselves overcome with remorse at having unwittingly participated in the dismantling of the last great Muslim empire. Their grief was mingled with a profound sense of betrayal. Britain, they charged, had broken its pledge to Indian Muslims to protect the sanctity of Islam's holy places during the war. As the founder of the Comrade, a Muslim nationalist paper, well, I, I, let's say a, a Muslim uh, progressive and cosmopolitan paper in Delhi, Muhammad Ali Johar bellowed into a crowd of protesters in 1919, the Indian Muslims fought for the English and shed the blood of their own co-religionists, even against their Khalifa. And it was with their assistance that Baghdad, Jerusalem, Mesopotamia, and Arabia were run over and taken. So in 1919, this movement coalesced called the Khilafat movement in India, uh, which was protesting against the Allied dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, or the, the Allied role in sort of dissembling the Ottoman Empire. With some difficulty, Gandhi persuaded the leadership of the Khilafat movement to embrace his nonviolent methods of satyagraha. With their support, he secured the leadership of the Congress party in 1920. The resulting coalition between Congress and Indian Muslim politicians is often described as the high watermark of Hindu Muslim nationalist cooperation within India. Between 1920 and 1922, it galvanized a veritable tidal wave of mass strikes, civil disobedience, and the boycott of British goods and institutions throughout the subcontinent. But the honeymoon was short. It ended in dashed hopes on both sides. In 1922, Gandhi called off his non-cooperation movement in response to a violent attack by anti-colonial protesters in Chauri Chauda. The Khilafatists were disillusioned, but the greater betrayal in some ways came from Istanbul, where the government of Mustafa Kemal dissolved the institution of the caliphate, essentially robbing the Indian Muslims of their raison d'etre. The experience left these Indian pan-Islamists all dressed up with nowhere to go and to varying degrees disillusioned with the prospect of alliance with the Congress movement. The lesson for Gandhi and the Congress uh, participants was somewhat different. Particularly with time, it became apparent to them that Middle Eastern politics was one of the very few issues which had the potential to galvanize Muslim unity with Congress. So I'm gonna to return to these themes in a, in a bit, but for now, I'd like us to turn our attention slightly westward. Because at the same moment as the non-cooperation and Khilafat movements were taking off in 1919 in India, there was a simultaneous anti-colonial uprising underway in Egypt. The Egyptian revolution, as it came to be known, was spearheaded by a secular nationalist party known as the WEFT, or delegation. Its figurehead was Saad Zaghloul, uh, and in 1924, he was to become the first prime minister uh, of Egypt. These popular movements in Egypt and India were aware of one another, both through pre-existing anti-colonial networks which had been established in Europe prior and during the war, and as a result of international press coverage of the uprisings. In 1922, the first thorough explanation of the Indian nationalist movement was published by the Islamic modernist press Al-Manar in Cairo. It was an Arabic translation of an English book by Abu Kalam Azad, the Congress, uh, the, the Congress leader, and paid special attention to the coalition being built at that time between Gandhi, Gandhi's Satyagraha movement and the Muslim Khilafatists. 
Meanwhile, in India, Gandhi was assigning his disciples in the Satyagraha movement, a biography of the Egyptian nationalist Mustafa Kemal. He would later tell an Egyptian diplomat that he considered Zahlul, as leader of the West, to have been, quote, the father of all nationalist movements in the East, including India. Over the course of the 20s and 30s, this mutual admiration between the Egyptians and Indians uh, grew into a network of contacts, correspondence, visits, and exchanges of delegations. And I just, I'm gonna make a slight detour here uh, to show you some of the imagery and iconography from this early period of the nationalist movements. So this is still an emerging area of my own work, but given that today's event is being co-sponsored by the Islamic Arts Center at SOAS, I thought I would do my best to explore the visual culture of the kind of entanglement and interaction that I'm describing. So these are two images produced by the Ghadar movement of Indian anti-colonial radicals during World War I. Both were published initially in San Francisco where the Ghadar movement was headquartered, although they quickly began to circulate elsewhere. We know that the first image produced for an English language journal uh, was created in consultation with an Irish nationalist, George Friedman, and modeled on uh, Irish Republican iconography of that period. It's very clear that this publication and this image were an attempt to make inroads with American and other Anglophone audiences and to gain their support for India's independence movement. The second image was printed in the vernacular Guru Muhi journal, Yugantar, and intended for an audience of migrant laborers on the North American West Coast. However, as Professor Arijit Sin has noted, uh, it gained broad traction and was reprinted over the course of several years, both in publications within India, as well as in Europe and in other locales with Indian migrant communities. The version that I've reproduced here was the cover for a collection of anti-colonial poetry called Ghadar di Gunj, or Echoes of Rebellion, a reference to the 1867 Indian uprising against the British. So both of these images depict Bharat Mata or Mother India and connect the feminine embodiment of the nation to a map, there are clearly important divergences in their visual references. The first we can state with confidence was inspired by Irish nationalist imagery of that time and that was in turn influenced by other European depictions of the woman as nation, most famously France's Marianne. However, while Professor Sen connects the second image to purely indigenous Indian cultural sources, I'm personally not convinced of that. We know that in addition to connections with Irish Republicans, the Ghadar movement also had ties to Egyptian nationalists. And to me, this image is remarkably similar to contemporary Egyptian symbols, which were also being mobilized at that time uh, toward nationalist movement ends. So here is my visual case. It's true that Indian goddess imagery includes snakes or cobra headdresses, visual symbols of kundalini energy. But in Indian iconography, for example, of the snake goddess Manasa, as you can see, the snakes, plural, create an almost Medusan multi-pronged crown. And this is also what we find in more modern representations of South Asian snake gods and goddesses, uh, for example, in Sri Lanka, where they continue to be extremely popular. Uh, meanwhile, the iconography of Bharat Mata specifically, both prior to World War I and later on in the interwar years, is actually quite uniform in its depiction of her headgear. Mother India is shown either wearing a golden crown resembling a helmet, as in this image on the right, or particularly in imagery linking her to the Gandhian current of the nationalist movement, a more modest veil, as on the image on the left. So, if we have uh, these, all of these four representations from the 1910s through the 1940s, uh, this image in particular, uh, and I, I wanna draw attention in particular to the circlet with the single protruding cobra on the forehead is somewhat anomalous within the Indian canon, whether we're looking at nationalist depictions of mother India or goddess iconography. However, it fits remarkably well with contemporary Egyptian nationalist iconography, such as these illustrations from the era of the 1919 revolution. It also resembles Western depictions of a mythologized Egyptian woman, for example, 19th and early 20th century paintings, illustrations, and theatrical portraits of Cleopatra, 
which of course Indians would have also been familiar with. The presence of the lion in nationalist imagery across India and Egypt at this time is also remarkable, although the significations vary. In Egyptian imagery of this period, the lion as opposed to the sphinx uh, was usually a representation of Britain. In the Indian images, however, the lion belongs to Bharat Mata, likely in the same way that it belongs to Durga, the Hindu goddess of war, who is usually depicted riding a lion. So the point that I want to make here is that the cultures of anti-colonialism and nationalism in this era, much like the ideational landscapes from which they were emerging, were both deeply entangled with indigenous cultures, ideas, and mythologies, as well as with the cultures, economies, and mobilities associated with empire and the West. The Egyptian and Indian popular movements of this period were in dialogue with one another, but the, but the dialogue that was taking place was in many cases mitigated or transmitted through uh, imperial and other Western intermediaries, whether trade networks or uh, media networks of uh, circulation or through Western capitals or contacts in, in Europe and North America. Simultaneously and arguably in direct reaction to this dynamic, at this time, the concept of Eastern authenticity began to take on increasing cultural cachet and allure, both in the colonies and in metropoles. This trend, this hunger for the authentic and its uneasy relationship with a corresponding impulse towards the modern had important implications for the people and events that I want to discuss. For example, both the Egyptian weft and the Gandhian Satyagrahis looked to their country's ancient forebears for inspiration. However, the idealized visions of the nation which emerged were radically different from one another. As we have seen, the weft celebrated the glorious legacy of ancient Egypt, a worldly empire ruled by powerful kings and queens, pharaohs. It also embraced many aspects of Western modernity, notably expanded access to education, parliamentary democracy, and modern technology, and its bid to restore Egypt to its former glory and ensure a central role on the world stage. This statue, Nehdat Masr, The Awakening or Renaissance of Egypt by, Mah by the Egyptian sculptor Mahmoud Mukhtar, was unveiled in the presence of Zaghloul and other members of the Weft in 1927. It shows the mighty sphinx rising on its haunches as if stirring after a long nap. A peasant woman, her arm wrapped around the sphinx, lifts the veil off her face and gazes confidently towards the horizon. The sculpture epitomized the self-perception of the weft and its supporters who saw their movement as heralding the dawn of a new golden age for Egypt comparable to the reign of the pharaohs. While hearkening back to this glorious past, the movement also saw itself as pushing the country forward into the modern world, a world which was decidedly ruled by science, reason, and secularism, a world where education and technology would uplift Egypt's peasantry and liberate its women, and a world in which Egypt would, once again, take its rightful place at the center of the world stage. I'd like to contrast this image with the idealized vision of ancient India evoked by Gandhi, which was a land of simplicity and spiritual purity, unsullied by the corruption and materialism of the West. His political vision, inspired by the Ramayana, emphasized spiritual virtue and devotion, rather than evoking India's great rulers or innovators of the past, or its warriors for that matter, it was the simple way of life of India's peasants, their very unworldliness, which he held up as a model for the nation. Whereas in Egypt, the nationalists adopted the regal sphinx and the pyramids, symbols of the pharaohs, Gandhi chose the equally ancient charka and urged his disciples to use it to make their own clothes. From the beginning then, there were important differences as well as affinities between Egyptian and Indian visions of a post-colonial future. And if you remember those images that I showed you of Bharat Mata, that warrior Bharat Mata with the sword in her hand, uh, you know, is in a sense replaced after World War I 
and the more that Gandhi's current becomes uh, emerges as sort of like the, the the mainstream movement within Indian nationalism, you see her being re replaced with someone much more uh, identifiable as either a goddess or as uh, as a mother so with wearing the veil, for example, um, in the image of her with with Gandhi seated on her lap with the charka. By 1923, Indian and Egyptian feminist activists had also begun to seek out one another's company. A photograph from the Ninth Congress of the International Alliance of Women, held in Rome that May, shows Huda Sharawi, the Egyptian feminist leader, Sarojini Naidu, the nationalist poet from India, and the national de delegations that they led, 10 women in all, standing in an Italian courtyard, arm in arm, intermingled and smiling. As the only two delegations from Eastern colonized countries to have attended the conference, the affinity between the women was quite natural. That said, the differing nationalist attitudes towards materialism and modernity are, I think, clearly visible here as well. The Indian delegates are dressed in saris, with few exceptions. They are absent much embellishment and certainly absent any indication of Western dress. By contrast, their Egyptian colleagues wear heeled shoes and stockings, jaunty caps, and tailored ensembles. In their enthusiasm for the current European trends in women's fashion, the Egyptian delegates seemingly mirror the Art Deco movement's corresponding embrace of ancient Egyptian motifs. Despite these differences, the exchange of ideas and the camaraderie between the women was very genuine. Upon her return to Cairo, Huda Shahrawi drew inspiration from Gandhi's non-cooperation movement to organize her own very successful Egyptian boycott of British goods and services. The friendships between the women in this photograph would deepen over the course of the 1930s and 40s as they continue to correspond with one another, meet at conferences like this one, and even visit one another in their respective homes. So this is sort of a snapshot of the lay of the land in the early to mid 1920s as these networks and connections begin to burgeon. And now I'm gonna fast forward into the 30s to trace where these dynamics head, what the trajectory looks like uh, in the lead up to World War II. So the records are clear that Indian Muslim politicians begin paying attention to developments in the British mandate of Palestine in the 1920s, almost directly corresponding with uh, the uh, with the, the dissolution of the caliphate uh, in Istanbul in 1924. And there's a few years in the late 1920s where there's some debate happening within the Muslim world about, well, should we reestablish the caliphate? Should we, uh, you know, re uh, should we choose a new caliph? Should we move the caliph to a new city such as Cairo or to Mecca? And this issue dies down in the late 1920s. And right around that time, we have the first delegations of Palestinians arriving in South Asia. And through those contacts that they, they meet with the Muslim League during their trip in, in the 1920s, uh, and Indians start to travel to the Middle East around, uh, around that time as well. So we start to have um, back and forth, mainly with the Muslim League uh, and a number of uh, nationalists from, from various Arab countries. And they begin to really refocus the energy that had been initially focused on the caliphate issue, uh, the new concern about you know, British uh, protection of holy places becomes Mandate Palestine. So this is something that's ongoing by the late 20s, but in 1937, a report is published which recommended the partition of the country into Jewish and Arab territories. This gave rise to a popular uprising known as the Arab Revolt, and it prompted far more serious and concerted political action by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who by this time is the leader of the Muslim League and his colleagues. My research indicates, I think quite definitively, that the Muslim League's political investment in the Palestinian cause was far more substantial than has been previously understood. The reason for this had partly to do with pan-Islamic ideology, as had also been the case during the Khilafat movement, but in the late 1930s, there is also a new element, namely domestic political competition between the League and the Congress Party, resulting from the newly ratified India Act, which had vastly expanded the electoral franchise. The Muslim League actually told British officials on multiple occasions after 1937 that they feared that the crisis in Palestine could result in what they called a second Khilafat, by which they meant a second instance of Hindu Muslim coalition against British authority 
as had existed between the Khilafat leaders and Gandhi's non-cooperation movement. This was an outcome which gravely concerned the Muslim League as they were trying to consolidate their own hold on the Muslim vote. They worried that if they could not prove to Muslim voters that they were effective advocates who had the ear of the British government, they risked losing support to Congress because Gandhi and Nehru were also supportive of the Arab Palestinians. So Gandhi and Nehru's position was partly based on anti-colonial grounds, as had been the case during the Khilafat movement. But post-1937, Palestine and Arab affairs were also gaining traction within Congress precisely because these issues were perceived as meaningful to Indian Muslim voters. So while the Muslim League was alive to the threat, as they considered it, of a second Khilafat, Congress was also alive to the possibility posed by a second Khilafat issue that might consolidate voting. On multiple occasions, the Muslim League went so far as to threaten British officials that failure to resolve the Palestine crisis on terms favorable to the Arabs could undermine Muslim loyalty to the British crown and prevent their participation in a future war. And this is, again, given the context of the late 1930s, uh, this, this is really significant. This catches the attention of a lot of officials in London. Dissatisfied, however, with the limited impact that their petitions are having, they resolved to send a delegation on a tour of the Middle East, Britain and Europe, to make their case in person to uh, European officials, to British officials, and uh, to collaborate more with the Arab diplomacy that was at that point being mobilized in support of the Palestinians. As they were making preparations for this tour, Nehru also found himself in Egypt. His steamer had just entered the canal when he received an invitation to disembark. The weft arranged for his transport to Alexandria to meet with party notables, including the former Egyptian prime minister, Mustafa Mahes, uh, and uh, multiple cabinet officials. Their time together was brief, just one day, while Nehru's ship made its way up the Suez Canal. In addition to a banquet lunch, which Nehru frankly found overwhelming, uh, much of the discussion amounted to comparing notes. How each party was waging the struggle against imperialism and domestic enemies the successes and defeats of recent years, and what lessons could be drawn from their experiences. Nehru was quite explicit in his criticism of the West's failure to organize effectively at the grassroots level among Egypt's peasants and working classes. He saw the West's liberal capitalism and outsized reliance on the landed aristocracy as the roots of its weakness in combating both imperialism and the creeping authoritarianism of Egypt's monarchy. Nevertheless, on a personal level, the two men got on extremely well. They kept in touch and visited each other several times after that initial encounter, and their correspondence indicates the extent of the institutional alliance which they intended to forge between Congress and the West. Nehru wrote to Nahas in October of that year that, quote, there was so much in common between us and our respective national movements that it would be to the great advantage of both of us to cooperate with each other as much as we can. He outlined a comprehensive plan to bring the two parties into closer cooperation with and ideological alignment, including the exchange of a weekly newsletter tracking political, economic, social, and cultural developments in Egypt and India, the exchange of formal delegations on a regular basis, for example, to annual uh, Congress meetings, uh, participation by both parties in the same international organizations so as to maintain high-level contacts and influence current events on a global stage, cooperation between their affiliated youth wings. And perhaps from my perspective, most tellingly, the WEFT was to support Congress in achieving what Nehru called the unity of the Indian liberation movement, both by serving as an example of an anti-sectarian nationalism and through its alliance with Congress as the mainstream nationalist party in a Muslim majority country. So quite literally, Congress, and particularly Nehru, was eager to show off the WEFT as their Muslim best friends, and, to, and that basically the WEFT was going to work as proof that Congress was a genuinely non-sectarian party. So this, in any case, was how the relationship was intended to work in theory. That theory was to be tested the following spring when a delegation of WEFT officials arrived in India as the guests of the National Congress Party. But before we follow them uh, to India, let's catch up with the Muslim League's Palestine delegation 
who were at that time also en route to Cairo. So Nehru's visit was uh, in June of 1938 and October of 1938. We also have, uh, uh, we have a delegation from the Muslim League arriving in Egypt. The announcement of a World Interparliamentary Congress of Arab and Muslim countries for the defense of Palestine provided the ideal launch pad for their journey. Roughly 200 male and female delegates from over a dozen countries descended on the Egyptian capital that October. And to clarify, there were, there were uh, separate conferences for men and women, but they were organized uh, very much in the spirit of collaboration and they were on consecutive days so that the women could attend the sessions of the men's conference as well. In addition to the countries of the Arab region, there were delegations from Iran, China, Spanish Morocco, Yugoslavia, Turkey, the United States, and India. Among the Indian delegates were two uh, members of Legislative Assembly from India, Chudri Khaliko Zaman of the United Provinces and Abdurrahman Sadiqi of Bengal. In their speeches, they claimed to speak for India's 80 million Muslims and warned Britain that should the Palestine issue remain unresolved, it would not be able to rely on the support of world Muslims in the coming European war. And this Congress was held right after the Munich crisis. So the timing was very significant and the delegates knew exactly what sort of pressure points they were placing uh, on, on uh, Britain and France at that time. Participation in the Cairo Congress strengthened connections between the Indian delegates and their Egyptian and Arab allies. Upon its completion, Siddiqui and Khaliko Zaman, who from here on I refer to collectively as the MLAs, the members of Legislative Assembly, uh, they were nominated by the other conference delegates to travel to London to make representations to the British government on behalf of, of the Congress in Cairo. So why were these two Indians nominated out of the hundreds of delegates from across the Arab and Muslim world who were present? I have two thoughts on this. The first is their status as barristers and elected officials may have played a role, uh, but there were many other trained lawyers in attendance and many other uh, members of parliaments. I think it was actually precisely the fact that they were Indian and thus perceived as having a certain intimacy with the institutions of the British Empire and enjoying a status of subjects of the crown. Because the British presence in the Arab region was in many ways informal and in any case relatively new, Arabs did not have access or did not know how to access British channels of government. The MLAs were to prove that in contrast, they did understand how to work these channels very effectively. When they arrived in London, they were able within a short time to arrange multiple private audiences with British cabinet ministers, for example. When the Cairo Congress on Palestine was announced, Nehru was in London and he greeted the news with suspicion and dismay. He perceived the overtly Islamic framing of the event as an affront to him and his allies in the West and a threat to the secular anti-colonial politics they were working to uphold. He was disappointed but unsurprised to learn that the Muslim League had sent a delegation. As I mentioned, Palestine was also important to Nehru, but it was only as important as all of the other similar struggles then underway in places like Spain, China, Abyssinia, uh, whereas for the Muslim League, Palestine was probably at this point the single most important issue outside of the plight of Indian Muslims themselves. What was true for all of these men, for Nehru, Gandhi, uh, for Nehru and Gandhi, for Jinnah, for Siddiqui and Khaliko Zaman, was that Palestine was becoming another way of talking about domestic politics in India. Thus, while the Muslim League insisted that Palestine was a matter of global Muslim concern, Nehru was adamant that the matter at stake was not religion, but the universal struggle against imperialism. To this end, his speeches and letters from this period called again and again for Jews and Arabs in Palestine to come together to oust the British, thus alighting some of the political realities on the ground in order to come to a neater comparison with the politics of national unity that he was then promoting within India. We can compare this to an encounter that Khaliko Zaman had with Mustafa and Nahes, the weft leader in Cairo. So uh, of course Nahes and Nehru were becoming firm friends and Nahes was siding a bit with Nehru uh, in terms of Indian politics. Khaliko Zaman was really disappointed by this and he said uh, that in his interview with him, 
uh, during the Cairo con conference, Nahas Baja was singularly ill-informed about the history of the Muslims in India or their differences with the Congress and applied his experience of life in Egypt to India so literally as to make the Muslim problem of India exactly as the Jewish or Christian problem which Saad Zadlul Basha had to face in Egypt, thus completely ignoring the size, the difference in the size of the two countries. So in a sense, we see that the Congress party, the WEFT and the Muslim League were all reproducing their positions on domestic politics and their attitudes toward external affairs. In the case of the Muslim League specifically, this resulted in an interesting paradox which Faisal Devshi has made, um, has, has observed, which is that the League was fighting against the partition of Palestine, where Muslims were in a majority, while campaigning for the partition of India, where of course they were not. From Cairo, the MLAs embarked on a sort of free Palestine world tour, conferring with everyone from the colonial secretary in London, to Mussolini's brother in Milan, to the chairman of the League of Nations in Geneva, to the Mufti of Jerusalem in Beirut, which was the photograph that I used uh, for uh, the poster for this talk. It was an exhausting itinerary. I'd be happy to discuss it in detail in the Q&A, but for now, what I really wanna emphasize is the level of political, financial, and emotional investment it demonstrated on the part of these men and of the Muslim League which was at this time still very much an underdog movement within India without a lot of uh, mainstream support, but it was already projecting itself as a global player abroad. And in my book, I argue that in fact, this tour and the engagement with the problem of Palestine more broadly was a formative experience for the Muslim League in their transition from what we might call a religious uh, interest group or communal group within the context of empire towards seeing themselves as a nation in the making with their own distinct foreign policy. So while all of this is going on across Europe and the Middle East, the Egyptian representatives of the left, as I mentioned, were steaming their way towards India. They disembarked on the pier in Bombay on 8th March, 1939. Awaiting them was quite the welcome committee, two committees to be exact. The INC had erected a large marquee and assembled a crowd of party notables and volunteers to greet their honored guests. Nearby, a smaller party of Muslim League representatives had also gathered to welcome the Egyptians. They were invited and declined to join the Congress members in their tent. For the WEFT envoys, it was the beginning of what would be at times an awkward tour of the subcontinent, carried out under the watchful eyes of the Cairo City Police and the Indian Intelligence Bureau. The tour first proceeded from the port in Bombay to Tripuri, uh, where they were met at the station by Nehru and billeted in the government rest house. That evening, the Egyptians were the guests of honor at the first sitting of the Congress session and warmly welcomed by Shubash Chandra Bose in his presidential address. This was of course destined to be the same session of Congress in which Bose would face off against Gandhi and ultimately be forced to resign. Accounts of the Egyptians' participation in the Tripoli session vary widely between contemporary sources. Indian intelligence claimed that the WEFT witnessed Congress, quote, rent by internal dissensions and on occasion in a state of uncontrolled uproar. However, it may be closer to the truth to say that Indian intelligence agents, well versed in the ins and outs of local politics and always quick to capitalize on any whiff of division, themselves saw Congress rent by dissension and presumed that the effect on the Egyptian guests would be similarly unfavorable. Quite the opposite would appear to have been the case judging by Abul Fath's own account of the meeting. So this is one of the representatives of the WEFT. And in his report after his uh, trip to India, he waxed poetic about what he called the two currents of political thinking within Congress and the ultimate victory of Gandhi's moderates over Bose's extremists. This outcome, which Abul Fath undoubtedly considered to be positive and hopeful, was of much greater importance to him than the existence of internal divisions within the party. That was a relatively uh, you know, uh, mundane reality of political life with which the WEFT, as another big tent nationalist party, was only too familiar. British officials in Cairo were informed by their agents that a secret meeting took place at Tripoli between Egyptian delegates and some Congress leaders at which it was decided that the All India Congress Committee should henceforth be linked up with the WEFT of Egypt in connection with their political movements. 
In the context of the letters which we saw exchanged between Nero and Nahas the previous autumn, it is likely that this meeting represented a formal adoption of the program that they had laid out for coordination between the parties. From Tripoli, the Egyptian delegation traveled to Allahabad and then on to Lucknow, Delhi, Lahore, and Peshawar. In Delhi, they were gratified by an hour long audience with Gandhi and Nehru. It was reported that, quote, they spoke about their visit and the necessity of cooperation between Egypt and India to fight their adversary and obtain independence. But the tone of the visit was in fact not very anti-British. This was admitted even by the normally suspicious agents of Indian intelligence. Quote, there is no reason to believe that the members of the delegation indulged in any anti-British talk while in India. Indeed, it is on record that on one occasion at least, they said that Egypt was on very good terms with England and depended on England for her military protection until she had built up her own defense forces. For his part, Gandhi told the West that in the event of war, Congress would remain loyal to the British crown in the expectation that Britain would reciprocate by granting India greater autonomy after the war. Nehru may well have disagreed with his aging mentor on this point of political strategy. Nevertheless, it did not fail to impress their Egyptian guests. The exchange of views is also significant for in it we see clearly that both the West and the Gandhian currents within Congress regarded their relationship with Great Britain in similar terms as they contemplated the near inevitability of a second global conflict. Neither party viewed that relationship as hostile or zero sum. The slow devolution of powers from Britain to Cairo and Delhi was perceived as proceeding at a tolerable pace and perhaps about to accelerate once the international situation had stabilized. There was opportunity too in the coming war insofar as Egyptian defenses might thus be built up and India with its vast army given the chance to purchase its freedom through service to the empire. While in the Indian capital, the delegates also met with Jinnah. The Muslim League was unsurprisingly less than enthusiastic about the West's decision to side with Congress on the communal issue and Jinnah was reported to have not minced words in conveying his displeasure. The effect on ordinary Muslims was said to have been similarly disappointing. According to Indian intelligence, generally Muslims recognized the delegation for what it was, an instrument of Congress, and ignored it, or noticed only to sneer. At the end of their time in India, the delegates sailed home to Cairo. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay followed them back across the ocean a short time later at the invitation of the Egyptians whom she'd met at Tripoli. This is a passage from her memoir where she describes her arrival in Egypt. It was late as our boat approached the dock at Port Said when I saw a number of small boats with sparkling lights crowding up to it. Our Arab hosts got us off within minutes and I found myself right in the midst of the twinkling boats, the air shaken, by vibrant slogans from young throats. Our hosts explained they were the, the youth wing of the Weft party, very excited over a fraternal visit from a freedom fighter from India. They had hit on this novel reception since the boat was docking late at night. Although she was formerly a guest of the Weft, Chattopadhyay stayed with Huda Sharawi, the Egyptian feminist leader, and a friend of her sister-in-law, Sarojin Nedu from the International Women's Conferences they'd attended together. Much like Nehru, Chattopadhyay was simultaneously charmed by the romance of Egypt and skeptical of the West's ability to shoulder the heavy mantle of the nationalist movement. She waxed poetic about Egyptian archeology span and found a visit to the Egyptian museum to be the highlight of the entire trip. But those that she met from the West, particularly the men were in her view, typical bourgeois politicians, patriotic no doubt, but too firmly set in a smooth life of ease. On the other hand, she found genuine pleasure in spending time with her host Huda and the other women of the feminist and nationalist currents in Cairo. But the meeting which seems to have left the deepest impression on her was with Abdel Krim, the exiled revolutionary leader of the Moroccan Reef War of the 1920s. The two had a long interview which Chateaupadier recorded in detail. She asked him if he knew of the Indian struggle for freedom, to which he replied, yes, you have the advantage of the inspiration and guidance of the greatest leader in the world today. He also told her that, quote, the days of colonialism are numbered. 
The coming war will end it, I have no doubt. In line with the plan laid out by Nehru and Haas, a large Congress delegation was scheduled to travel to Egypt for an official visit in 1940, but of course it was not to be. Within months, Europe was at war, and while at varying paces, the world would soon follow. To conclude, I'm just going to offer a few observations, um, which might help us get the ball rolling for the Q&A, that's all right. Uh, so one of the arguments I'd like to make is that throughout the interwar years, but increasingly as we move into the 1930s, Indian nationalists, both the Muslim League and the Congress leaders, were engaging with the Middle East as a means of articulating and advancing their domestic political agendas. They mobilized discourses surrounding events like the dissolution of the Ottoman Caliphate, the 1919 Egyptian Revolution, and the growing crisis in Mandate Palestine as metaphors intended to bolster their own competing political visions, whether for a multi-confessional and anti-colonial mosaic state, or for a global ingathering of Muslims, which might form the, uh, the basis for a next uh, great transnational empire or power block. However, the realities on the ground in places like Istanbul, Cairo, and Jerusalem frequently resisted the neat parallels which Indian nationalists sought to chart onto them. What I'm interested in is not so much arriving at a binary answer for why Indian nationalists engaged with Middle Eastern politics, it was for this reason, not for that one, but instead to get, all, uh, to get at all of the different ways in which domestic political agendas were inserting themselves into transnational events and relationships, which were ostensibly about other things, things like religious unity or anti-colonial solidarity. And precisely because domestic political agendas were clearly informing Indian engagement with the Middle East, I see these interactions as also shaping uh, Indian nationalist agendas in turn. At least that's what I've tried to persuade you of today. Uh, in writing this book, my goal has been to, uh, to begin constructing a more holistic portrait of the interwar years in the East, where these 20 years represent an era of uh, intense transnational moment and momentous transformation at every level of society. And I say begin to construct because to me this research does not represent more than an exposition of the kinds of new information and insights which become possible when we collapse the old frontiers and start asking questions about Palestine from Pakistani sources, questions about Indian politics from Egyptian sources, and questions about Britain and its empire from the vantage point of cities like Cairo, Delhi, Jerusalem, and Mumbai. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Erin. That's really very, very interesting. Um, and I just, uh, if anyone would like to ask questions, we can just use the chat uh, icon at the bottom of your screens, which you can type them in there now. And I, I'll just uh, start off with one. I was just wondering, um, you have this described very in detail this relationship between the the nationalist movements if you like of e in Egypt and in uh, India I was just wondering what about the uh, other Arab countries how did they they view this relationship uh yeah no this is a great question and uh it's actually something that I'm still at this stage like finding out more about every time I go back into the archives uh because it's seems to have varied a great deal from country to country. So uh, within the context of uh, you know, the talk today, I mainly focused on Egypt. I also brought in Palestine a little bit because uh, the relationships with Palestinians is actually one of the ones that's, it evolves the most over the course of the 1920s and 30s. So we have, for example, a delegation that travels from Palestine to India in the 1920s, as I mentioned, and they're very impressed at that time with Gandhi's nonviolent uh, Satyagraha mo movement. Uh, and so there is, they come back to Palestine and uh, some among them, including uh, Jamal Husseini, who is the brother of uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, or uh, sorry, the cousin of the Mufti of Jerusalem. Uh, he's, he writes about, you know, I think that we need to be doing a Gandhian movement here uh, against the British, right? Uh, and of course, as time goes on, uh, the Palestinian nationalist movement uh, essentially becomes frustrated with their interactions with the British diplomacy, the lack of movement 
And uh, they become more committed to the idea that there has to be, you know, that the only language the British will understand is force and that they need to have an Arab revolt, you know, in order to really get their message across. And uh, Jamal Husseini is present at the conference in uh, London in 1939, which I alluded to. And at that conference, he's actually really insistent that there is no parallel that can be drawn between the circumstance of the Indian nationalist movement and Palestine. The reason being that India has been a British colony for 200 years, whereas Palestine is not a colony. Palestine is under a mandate system. It had a parliament before that within the context of the Ottoman Empire. And so there's no uh, colonial grounds basically for a comparison because uh, you know Palestine has the right to its independence in a different way. Uh, so that's within one individual let's say, the evolution that takes place over the course of this time period. And I've recently been reading more about um, uh, the circumstances in Iraq, which, which was in a completely different situation because they were actually, you know, subject to a major Indian uh, colonial military force. And as a result, there were a lot of associations of India and Indians with colon with with being a colonial power, right? So during the Second World War, uh, actually the Ministry of Information in London is really concerned about uh, the prospect of any propaganda, for example, being sent out from India to Iraq on the grounds that Iraqis don't like India and Indians because they see them as a colonial occupying force. Mm -hmm. oh, so those are two examples yeah, I can offer. Thank you, no, thank you very much. Right, well, we've got a few questions here. Um, have I understood this correctly? Uh, there was little or no actual contact with the Irish nationalist movement. Um, so I think that the question is, the, uh, the, there was no, was there any contact? I think this must be referring to, is this referring to Radar? Maybe the, the person? Those, those images which you, right. you it's, it's established that that particular image was an image that the Radar Party created in consultation with George Friedman, who was a publisher based in New York, who was an Irish Republican. So I'm not suggesting that the extent of the ties goes anywhere beyond that, but that particular image is the result of a collaboration between the two movements. Right. Thank you. And here's uh, another one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halloran, for the session. I have a question about the shift of focus of Mr. Jinnah. Uh, he was of the opinion that Indian Muslims have nothing to do with the Khilafat. Did his view remain the same throughout the period? Thank you for this question. This is one of the things that I spend a lot of my free time uh, thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm out on walks, when I'm making coffee, I'm wondering what happened, you know, what is what 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 um, what goes on in Jinnah's mind uh, around the Palestine issue, because, as you rightly point out, uh, Jinnah is absolutely opposed to Khilafat. He breaks with Congress and the Muslim League over the issue of Khilafat because he does not um, appreciate what he considers to be Gandhi pandering to Indian Muslim religious sentiment, as opposed to conceding real political, uh, you know, uh, concessions to, to, the, to the Indian Muslims as, as he sees it. So uh, in a sense, and you know, he, he has a really good point that what Gandhi is doing here is, is uh, operating with Indian Muslims as well, we can have religious sympathy between the two parties. Uh, we, we support you and your uh, religious claims over the Khilafat uh, and in exchange for that sympathy, you know, come on board with us and with this movement, but it doesn't result in, for example, you know, any concessions on term, in terms of like uh, fixed, uh, fixed seats for Muslims within uh, provincial uh, government, which is one of the concessions that they're asking for at that time. And yet, when we arrive in the 1930s, we see Jinnah from, you know, to, to put it crudely, playing the Muslim card with the British. And Jinnah is, of course, a very uh, famously non-observant Muslim himself, right? He's not necessarily one to abstain from alcohol or to pray five times a day. But he uh, uses the concept of uh, British concern over uh, Muslim uh, religious sentiment as a real bargaining chip 
to try and win concessions on Palestine. And the only thing that I can offer is that he's a, he's a shrewd politician uh, and he understands that the Palestine issue has the potential to mobilize support behind his movement. He understands that the alternative to the Muslim League really taking this issue and running with it is potentially Congress again stepping in and dominating the issue in the same way that they were able to, to mobilize uh, support in the 1920s for Khilafat. So at a point in time where he's really trying to carve out political space for the Muslim League, he sees it as very important that the Muslim League be the party of uh, international uh, Muslim issues right, uh, or international Islamic politics, and that he is not above, uh, in a sense, you know, cynically playing this card with the British in order to uh, stoke, you know, stoke British concern and maybe mobilize action from, from, from the UK. Right, we have uh, uh, another um, question here, asking if you could speak more about the development of transnational uh, feminist nationalism. Uh, can a transnational framework help us understand how feminists were often asked to put aside questions of suffrage and equality in favor of national freedom from imperialism? Mm. Mm. This is really interesting during this period in time. It's something that both the Arab and the Indian feminists come up against, and it's a double-edged sword because at the same time as within their own countries, they're being asked to, you know, please put the brakes on and wait and be patient because the national issue is more important than the women's issue. They travel to international conferences where they are usually the only women who are not from uh, European and Western countries. And they are told in those fora by the white women that they really need to tone it down about this nationalism and all of these you know, anti-colonial demands because this is not a political organization, this is an organization that's focused on women's suffrage. So we really see uh, the position uh, that, that women in these countries get placed in where they're, you know, they, they can't make anybody happy <laughs> on the international stage. You know, they're too political, they're too anti-colonial, they're too nationalist and within their own countries, they're too uh, feminist. And uh, this is the origins of what becomes the, you know, the, the third world women's movement. This is the origins of a separate feminism that comes out of the post-colonial context. It begins with the incredible frustration that these women are feeling in, in the 1920s and 30s over, uh, you know, the inability to uh, make either other women or uh, their their uh, menfolk within the colonial situation understand that these issues must be, must be dealt with uh, in a intersectional way. Uh, so I think that actually the story about these women is, is one of the most compelling stories about uh, intersectionality that we can tell. No, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And, and, and there's, there's a, I have another question. I think you really, uh, perhaps you could just summarize this. Uh, uh, this question asks if you can share the rationale behind Gandhi's support for the Khilafat movement that you have found in your research. Well, you sort of out outlined that in your talk, but perhaps you could just encapsulate it in a, in a few sentences. Yeah, I think um, what I want to say about Gandhi's motivations is that it really dovetailed with the, uh, with the motivations of people like for example, uh, the Ali brothers, who were very instrumental in the Khilafat movement. And um, so essentially, whether you're looking at it from the perspective of Gandhi and Congress or from the leadership of the Khilafat movement, they're both um, really coming at nationalist anti-colonial politics uh, from a perspective of religious and spiritual conviction. And what they are attracted to in one another is the authenticity of those uh, religious convictions. That Gandhi sees liberation in India as something that is impossible without a spiritual revolution within each individual, really. And without, you know, and that's what Satyagraha is all about. It's about mobilizing the interior spiritual transformation towards, uh, you know, a project that will 
ultimately liberate the nation. And so he sees liberation of the soul and liberation of the country as linked. And that is also the perspective that the Khilafat movement is taking. They see that uh, with the dissolution of the Khilaf of the caliphate in in the in the Muslim world, that this is a loss of a of a you know spiritual center for Muslims, and it's and it's a result. It's a loss of political uh, potential. That it's a loss of political power, and so they're both really attracted to the sincerity of one another's convictions. Gandhi uh, apparently was attractive to the Ali brothers because he was somebody who wasn't afraid of throwing his body into the melee. He wasn't, he wasn't going to be cowed. He wasn't going to shy away because he wasn't afraid of physical violence, right? Because his conviction, his spiritual conviction was so strong. And similarly, Gandhi saw the Ali brothers who had spent uh, the whole of World War I in prison on charges of sedition as proof of their kind of bona fides, right? That these were people that had really strong faith. So the content of those beliefs, the fact that they were Muslim or, or Hindu wasn't as interesting or important to them as the, uh, as the sincerity of those beliefs. Thank you. Well, I think that's it. I have one last question and that is when is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I say, I'm going to add inshallah to the end of it, but you know, it's, it's still in revisions and everything, so it's going to be a little while, but I'm hopeful for 2022, and I'll certainly let you know when, <laughs> when I have a firmer date. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, we really uh, appreciate you giving this talk to us, and, and, and uh, also I hope that it gets a little bit... Uh, um, warmer where you are in Toronto. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of uh, nice comments uh, on the chat, which I think uh, Matty, Matty can print off and, and send for you. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. Thank you uh, for having uh, me. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, and good evening. And, have, well, wherever you are, some of you may not be evening, because I think... Um, Erin, it must be the afternoon, is it not? Late afternoon where you are. That's right. Yeah. Time for lunch. Time oh. for lunch. Okay. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. And I, Rosalind, would you like to? Yes. No, I'd just like to say that was absolutely fascinating because it's a period that you don't hear so much about. Mm -hmm. And um, having sort of lived in that part of the world and so on, I I'll say I hadn't associated the, the sort of Sphinx and so on and the, the national with Saad Zahu's um, actual mausoleum. I, was, I mean, there's a little mini Egyptian temple. <laughs> so that really, that really sort of struck the connection. Anyway, thank you so much, Erin. That was great. Thank you. Oh, Thanks so much for having me. Well, good luck with the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Good night. Good night.